good evening to all uh, this is uday from nyas welcome to dhamma bangalore times nyas today we have another well known scholar among bangalore history and inscriptions he wrote a lot of inscriptions in bangalore and that's another one mr uday kumar uh, we have same name <laughs> so uh, uh, before uh, so we come starting about his talk then i could take the opportunity to introduce him to you all and everybody knows him well but still this uh, my pleasure my opportunity right, to introduce they come to all mr uday kumar is a fascinating bangalorean an accidental historian and solutions he loves to research lesser known aspects of history especially in cities He is currently working to secure and build more awareness about Bangalore with critical inscription stones. In the past, as a risk, researched Bangalore and its connection with the Great Romanian Survey of India. He has a master degree in engineering mechanics from IIT Madras, and he has worked with Tata and General Electric. Mr. Uday Kumar was recognized as a Bombay Bangalore Citizen Individual of the Year 2019 for his work in area of heritage. Conservation in Bangalore. And myself and Nias is very happy to call Mr. Uday Kumar to give a lecture in the Nias platform. Hello, Bangalore Times. Today we'll be talking a different, completely different view of different aspects of Bangalore. This whole experience has been going on, and this talk will be little different from what we have seen in Bangalore, and it will be totally about the future. It will be there. Is is going to speak. Very, very fantastic talk that I can share to you all. Here I would hand over to Mr. Udayak Kumar. Sir, I'll make you a uh, host. Yes, sir, you will take over. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So, um, you know, firstly, thanks every to you and everyone else in Nias for this uh, fantastic opportunity. I've been wanting. Um, to talk to a nias audience for a long time um so thanks to covid you know now i'm doing it right from the comfort of my house so yeah. it is so much more easier <laughs> to do as well so thanks again and thanks to everyone who's made the time to join this um, uh, event uh, this evening um i will be i will be giving a perspective to you know the past of bangalore which is um, you know, like what i said a little different and um, you know what i believe is the way bangalore has to be understood um so i'll start sharing my screen um the way uh, uh, let me know if you are able to see the screen now you should be seeing yes sir yes sir i can see i can see wonderful okay so um you know uh, the way this is being presented is um, you know i think the story of the city um from the 15th century on is uh, fairly well known and say from the 18 19 20 century is i would say very well known uh, but however the city has an incredible past um and that is what i want to try and share with you today uh, so the way i'm putting it is that you know this is the story of this city um um you know as derived from a lot of sources uh first thing i just want to do a little bit of housekeeping uh if you are on a wire less connection uh quickly i recommend that you switch over to a wired connection if you have the latency issues buffering and all of that can uh basically mean that you know you lose out on some good uh, you know stuff Uh, just to let you know that i am on a very high speed network here so the issues are unlikely to be at this end uh, but most probably on the device that you are using there and uh, do mute your mics and uh, switch off your video uh, because you are not going to be seen by anyone at this time if you do insist on you know keeping your video on do remember that to put on some clothes you know these days from the comfort of our homes we forget that you know we are actually visible to people on a webinar as well If you are attending from a phone or a tablet, uh, my slides are oriented to be better viewed on landscape mode. So please tilt it over. 
so that you can um, see the slides better. I mean, you know, hold it like this instead of like this. Okay. Um, if um, you know, if you have any questions, do type it out in the chat window. I'll take them at the end of this talk and I'll answer. Uh, we will be talking, I'll be talking mostly in English today uh, with a few words of Kannada, Tamil and Telugu you know, thrown in as required, but the conversation is essentially in uh, uh, English. Okay. So with that, um, we can get started. But the outset, I want to make a disclosure. Everything that you, go, go, you are going to be seeing today in terms of photographs, videos, or any other objects there on the, on the slides, uh, none of them have been discovered by me. They've all been discovered by archaeologists or scientists or other people. All I've done is gathered that information, synthesized it, and I'm presenting it to you as the story of this city. Often there's a confusion that because it's so little known, people end up thinking that, you know, asking, did you discover this? None of this is discovered by me, the artifacts itself. Okay. So um, when we say the journey or the story of a place, I think one very important thing to get uh, clear about is what we mean by that. In, in, the, in, in the simplest and the most obvious uh, you know, manner, it's everything that has occurred at that place from the time when this planet was formed. And that's really the story of any place, right? Uh, but however, we preclude this in different ways, we segment it and we tend to see it in different ways. Uh, but that's not a story of this, uh, of any place at all. And often the, um, you know, the fog of the present tends to obscure the way we look at the past. So while we may look at it, you know, for a long duration, uh, you know, and see this is how things have played out, what's happening today, our own education, our politics, our upbringing, etc., tends to f uh, cloud some of this in the distant past. And we are, tend to apply perspectives um, to the past which are uh, you know, inappropriate or you know, tend to um, diffuse, change the past in many ways. So with this in, uh, you know, in mind, um, let's move on. And the fundamental question that's always asked is, okay, how old is Bengaluru? And my focus today is entirely on Bengaluru and nothing else at all. So with the point that, you know, the story of Bengaluru, the journey of Bengaluru is from the time this earth was formed, let's start at the absolute very beginning. And that very beginning is when, you know, planet earth was formed from stardust, you know, the dust of the, star, the sun kind of gathered, the planets were being formed and the sun was being formed. And that's about you know, 4.6 billion years ago long, 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 long time back when the earth was just one hot red molten globe or whatever shape it was at that point in time and slowly started to you know, condense into various forms. So about 4 billion years ago, the liquid shape started taking form at the top in terms of the crust and solidifying a bit into various pieces. For, for a few billion years, it remained in that stage and um, you know, then slowly solidified into six major plates, what they're called as, and thousands of minor such plates of fragments. So these were the you know, plates that were floating on, the, you know, on, this, on, on top of the molten liquid that was still there at the core. And this is the beginning of the earth. And you know, when these plates formed, there was a spot over there, which became a rock. And that rock, rocky place, slowly morphed into the Bengaluru that we know today. Right? So if, if this is what has transpired, and I'm skipping a lot of intermediate steps, but the gist of it is that, is there anything of that distant, hoary, violent past that's still there in this city, in this place? that we can see, we can touch, and we can correlate with. Yes, we can. And this is what, you know, is left from those days, about three and a half billion years old. And this is something that a majority of us have seen, walked over and know, but this photo is probably something that you don't instantly recognize. 
That's deliberately because of the way the photo has been taken. It was taken yesterday. So it's very much there in Bangalore today. And this rock is what's famous as the Lalbagh rock. You know, this lot. So this is the leftover piece or amongst the oldest rocks in the world. And that was, this is about 3.5 billion years old. So Bengaluru is very lucky to have something in it today, which is from that past. Very few cities, very few countries, very few places in the world have this kind of an opportunity or a luxury. Okay. So the story of Bengaluru for me actually starts here when earth itself was taking shape and the geography of earth was getting defined uh, in many ways. However, the story didn't start at Lalbagh or at that geographic place that where we, you know, we are used to it today. It started in a very different place. So it started uh, in many places, incidentally, in Bangalore have that same rock. While a lot of people tend to think that Lalbagh is where the rock is and that goes by the name of the peninsular nice. Okay? Now, it's not peculiar or special or unique to Lalbagh. It's the same rock that you will find at the Shavage Maleshwara Hills, uh, Kumar Swami layout near Outer Ring Road where Dhanan Sagar College is. It's the same place where I'm sitting today. I'm sitting in a location called Rajajnagar first R block, where Iskon Hill, you know, Iskon Temple has been built on a hillock. That's peninsular nice too. There's a Baswangudi Bull Temple, Hanumant Nagar, you know, a lot of Ragi Gudda, a lot of these places all have the same rock. In fact, this rock is so common, all our houses are being built with this three and a half billion year old rock. What, is, what goes into jelly and you know, road and concrete and everything else today in the city of Bangalore is most commonly peninsular nice. Three and a half billion year old material, which is very scarce elsewhere in the world, but it's so common and so abundant for us. Okay. However, like I was saying, this journey of Bangalore did not start at this spot. What is very interesting is when the plates were getting formed, where Bangalore was, is, uh, was it was on a plate that was somewhere in the Antarctic region and deep down in the Southern Hemisphere. And this graph, while it's a little, you know, may sound look a little technical, is not so at all. This is the location Bangalore, which I marked here as my home, 12.96, you know, uh, north and, seven, and whatever there. How did that plate journey over the last 250 million years ago uh, is what is shown here in terms of latitude. 250 million years ago is when, because we, we have some understanding of uh, how plates started moving at that point in time. Before that, it's fairly confusing. We don't know exactly where it was. But the point that we call as Bangalore today was actually located 70 degrees south. Today we are 13 degrees north of the equator. So 17 degrees south of the equator, 70 degrees south of the equator is very close to the um, poles, the southern poles, south pole. So we have, we have, we, you know, so that's, uh, that's why I said our journey started in the southern hemisphere. It didn't start, you know, in some, you know, in some other place. Over that period of time, started slowly moving up north, across the equator, and then we are at where we are today, which is 13 degrees north. Okay, so this place that we call Bangalore today, and the rock that we that is out there in Lalbagh called you know the Peninsular Nice, was not is not been sitting there all the time. It was sitting deep down further south, very close to the southern uh, the South Pole. It's quite amazing, isn't it? That's quite a journey for the city. Um, you know, in, in, that, in those many million years. Okay. Now, uh, well, that's one part of the story. The other unique thing that has also happened is the city has actually elevated itself up. We are fairly high up uh, from sea level. 
everybody thinks that we are 900 meters. Everybody, most people know that we are 900 meters above sea level. What we don't realize is how high up that is. And that's quite significant. When, you know, when you, when you see this animation, it's been developed by a friend, Raj Bhagat. All is done here is, and I'll play the animation in a minute, is what if the sea level kept rising up? Which are those places that would not be submerged, but you know, would still be there? And the way he thought it is any urban place location, which is still around, not submerged, is the new capital of India. Urban basically because you know, it cannot be any small place that can be called the capital of the country. So I'll play the animation, just keep a watch on this. Um, So as you're seeing, most of India is getting submerged at almost at the very end, Bangalore is the one that gets submerged. Much, you know, a little while later then you end up in the Himalayas and all of that. So almost all of this country, the urban uh, cities and the urban populations, at all of them are much below, you know, Bangalore. So I'll play it once more and you can see, you know, what happens to India if it was submerged continually up to about 9,000 meters, which is fictional but just helps, helps you understand how high 900 meters up is. It's also the reason why, you know, we have such pleasant weather. Because right now I'm sitting here with you without even a fan on and uh, most cities would, still, would be still in their late you know, 30s or 40s in the country. Okay, well, that's um, a little bit about the, um, you know, the geography and the uh, in earlier times. However, if you start thinking about I'll skip a lot of steps and then come to what happened about from a man's perspective. How, what do we know? When did man start living in these regions? So what evidence do we have of you know, people living in this place? And when I say this place, I'm, I'm talking about the city of Bangalore as it stands today, okay? which is every locality which is within BBMP, every locality which has that five, six pin code is Bangalore. And that's the story that I'm talking about. Okay. So this is in, a, in, in Jalali, you know, where the Air Force Station is. In the mid, um, you know, in the mid 40s, there was, um, the World War was going on. In, in preparation for the World War, uh, the British had built massive house, hospital there. The facilities were supposedly for all the casualties in this region, they would be flown in there and treated in those hospitals. Uh, the hospitals really were slightly of a different type, not what we would call as hospitals here. These are the, uh, I would say the isolation beds or the wards or, or things like that. And as per records, they intended to build about 10,000 such um, cottages in the Jalali area. They continue to exist to this day today. And they're used as uh, quarters today uh, for a lot of, um, you know, the HMT, HAL, BEL, Air Force, and some of these people there. So, uh, so the, the, in 45, uh, in 46, 47, 48, these also doubled up for a lot of other things. And at, at that point in time, uh, one Navy man, British Navy man, he was hospitalized there. He also was a double, um, is doing two jobs. One, he was an archaeologist and he was also a Navy man. So he's called Captain Todd. So he was admitted there and, um, you know, when he was um, in the hospital there, he was looking out the window and he saw two uh, hillocks adjoining the room. And those hillocks, basically because of his archaeology training, and um, looked like perfect sites for human habitation from prehistoric times. So one, one evening he uh, went out of the hospital to look around and almost unbelievably within walking distance, which is right behind this cottage, um, just across the compound wall, he found hundreds of what he calls as, you know, microlithic stone tools that are shown here. That's hundreds and you know, hundreds of them. So many that he, he called these as a factory. So this is not a, just a township or a village or a you know, place where people uh, stayed. 
this is actually uh, because of the um, raw material was there they were manufacturing these and you know giving it away to other people these were um, you know obviously stone tools uh, they are used for you know as arrowheads uh, cleavers spearheads or whatever uh, because the stone uh, don't assume that this is primitive man and these are dated to be from about 1000 bc which means about 3000 years from today okay uh, while they are stone implements they are not really people who are savages or something like that that would come to your mind when you look at this for um, analogy i've tried to tell you this is approximately the period when the vedas were being composed uh, you know elsewhere so the vedas are not no are no mean ta you know intellectual accomplishment these are not uh, you know if you, if the first thing that comes to your mind by think is looking at stone tools is oh okay you know they're all very must have been cavemen and all that no chance these were very very um, advanced people who were composing something called the you know sanskrit um, the language is well advanced they were uh, talking they were uh, composing the vedas and i'm saying approximately okay don't put a date around that it's a fairly complex intellectual uh, accomplishment they were an advanced civilization okay. unfortunately today we don't have the opportunity to see these tools uh, soon after that he had them uh, shipped out to the british uh, museum in london i believe that they're still there and um, you know you can get to see them there if you are in london um, however we do have these records to see but from approximately around the same time we have something else left over here so to about uh, you know 5 kilometers or between 5 and 10 kilometers east of jalalli is a place called kanur so this is on the um, you know on the hebbal kerpuram uh, ring road about 5 kilometers out of that on the tanisandra main road so not so really far out if you think about it so these uh, that this this thing that you are seeing here on the ground is actually a stone slab that's a roof this is a close up of that of of a dolmen a dolmen is a stone structure and i'll show it to you in a second which uh, performed uh, multiple roles the most often one being it was a um, uh, it was really like a funerary uh, this one for um, someone so it was a samadhi uh, kind of thing it was also a it, that structure also doubled as a granary and it could have been a dwelling as well so these structures enough you know, did all of that now the lady here her name is dr uh, dr almitra patel uh, she is uh, showing to us and this is the intact team uh, who were visiting uh, there to see this this is photo is from about may last year uh, this is the lady who's um, actually in uh, many ways saved the dolmen for us today hopefully for posterity as well what you are seeing here is an issue from 1994 when she discovered that so this uh, i'll go back for a second so this is um, a big open field today it's been deliberately kept that way there were five such structures and um, uh, she knew what they were at that time they were exposed she knew what they were and she used to often go to that place so the local villagers um, who were very familiar with her and who respected her a lot knew that this was a special uh, you know structure but the locals called this as the pandavara gudi you know the temple of the pandavas as is the local parlance for dolmens in the, this part of the country the belief is that the pandavas lived here and it also serves doubles as a temple in some places okay so what happened was uh, somebody had procured that land and um, they had excavated it for uh, building the foundation so soon as she came to know about it uh, this is about uh, half a kilometer from our house so she rushed over there and stopped the construction this is how it looked before it was demolished the structure that i showed you earlier this is how it looked so she saved it and this is the pit uh, where one of those dolmens has been de uh, destroyed and excavated so you can see the pot here that's the burial of the urn which typically carries the uh, another bones or uh, of the uh, person who was dead or the body of the person who was dead there okay along with the urn also are uh, other materials that are usually buried so these are the cooking vessels or you know drinking vessels or whatever supposed to be um, you know supposed to be uh, for the person for his afterlife usage as well okay 
So she realized this and she saved it. And all this that had been um, excavated, they saved it. Uh, and uh, the, um, the pottery and the bangles and whatever else that was uh, gathered from that had been donated to various institutions, uh, including Oriental Institute, the Mythic Society, Museum, and a few other places as well. And that one, which was still intact, they buried it again so that you know no one could uh, attempt to do it uh, do it until it was properly excavated. Now, this has been dated to about 1000 BC. Okay, so um, it's people talk about dolmens all over uh, you know, the country, right in our neighborhood, right in our city. We have a dolmen. This is not the only dolmen. This is the only dolmen that is still intact. Okay. We had similar such dolmens in Velandur, in Jalali, quite a few Chikjala, in quite a few places in and around what we call as Bangalore today. Okay. So there is clear cut evidence of people living here prehistoric times on in this uh, city or rather in this uh, place. Okay. Now if that's uh, just the house, this is also a little bit about the pastimes of these people that they had left for us. So these are rock paintings uh, from two different places. And uh, these, you can see here, um, this is on a boulder, it's a, you know, a painting on a boulder, a man is riding what looks like a horse, a horse or a donkey or something. It's uh, in Dotkaneli, uh, Dotkaneli, which is on Sajapur Road. Okay. On the boulder, there are multiple paintings there. And this is, uh, these are some of those samples. Over here, he's sitting on a horse. Over here is dra dragging the, um, uh, dragging a cow uh, by a rope. This is a scene that could play out even today. If you just go to the, if you just go to any of our villages, it's a common scene um, where someone's pulling a cow home. This is a very interesting uh, uh, you know, painting where um, a group of people are dancing. Okay, this is a dancing scene. You'll see one, two, three, four, and a fifth man here dancing. So it's probably a, the partying by the night and having a drink and partying or whatever. Okay, so we have rock art in this city from about the same time, you know, about 500, 2000 BC, 2500 to 3000 years ago. This is another example uh, from the other end of the city. It's just not that, you know, there's only one example, one evidence of this kind of. Um, uh, art or in artifacts in the in one uh, in the city. This is diametrically opposite. This is in a place called uh, Gatigere. Gatigere is um, you know on uh, on the Mysore Road, here the PS College. So the nice uh, interlink road, toll gate behind the PS College. The two hillocks which you can see even now, these were these were carved on the hillocks over there. Okay. And this um, talk that I'm giving you is not only to um, tell you the story of the city, but also to sensitize you to how much we care for heritage. What have we done with this is also very important uh, in, in, in many ways. And what we have done with it today is what, you, what I'm showing you here. So that big boulder with rock art, the dancing figures, the cow being dragged, uh, you know, the man riding the horse, all that boulder is today a garbage pit. It was dynamited to pieces about 10 years back to build a school there. And that pit uh, where this rock was sitting is now a dumping ground for garbage. That's, a, that's, that's what we cared for 3000 year old heritage. And this other place where you, know, you have all these, the scorpion, the snake and all the figures here on the rock, it's been completely quarried out. There's nothing left of the rock face. It's a D, it's a D, it's a D, water stagnates over here and uh, it's a quarry. So unfortunately we don't have the opportunity to see either, but we do know the exact locations because they've been documented in uh, journals by the people who discovered these. However, uh, we do have something which is similar in the neighborhood, not in Bangalore urban, but Bangalore rural. So this is Mangond and Ali from examples there. You know, you are seeing some uh, menhirs there. Uh, menhirs are typically thought to be, uh, you know, astronomical uh, uh, instruments of sorts. So they were used to mark calendars and, um, you know, be able to deduce dates and seasons and things like that. 
So these examples are still there, not too far out, uh, about 40 kilometers from Bangalore for us to see. Okay. Um, similar such um, megaliths, menhirs, dolmens, or whatever, large stone objects have been, have been discovered and documented in Belandur, which is in the news, national news often for all the wrong reasons. Jadali, which I spoke about a little earlier, Ragi Gudda. A lot of these, all of these have been destroyed either uh, because of casual, you know, urbanization where we wanted to build something there, a school, a house, <laughs> an office or whatever, or they've been indiscriminately destroyed by treasure hunters. There's a belief that, you know, there's a treasure in these places and uh, people dig, uh, dig them up and destroy them in the hope of finding a treasure. What they don't realize is what they're destroying is the treasure. Okay. And if it were just that, you know, we're still talking about stone and all that. We're still talking fairly, fairly local. But these coins that you're seeing on, they are from about 60 BC to 30 AD about 2000 years old, they're Roman coins. Okay. Roman coins in big numbers, about 250 coins in one place, 100 coins in other places, in, in three locations, hordes of coins have been found. These are from the times of Augustus Tiberius and Claudius Caesar. Rome's quite some distance away even today. It's not so easy to go there, but 2000 years ago, there was trade between people here and the Romans. And we have evidences of that in these Roman coins. Where were they found? So when they were laying the railway line, you know, the railway line we runs parallel from my house about two kilometers away. And Ashanpur railway station is another two kilometers away. If I peep out the window, I can see it. And they were, when they were digging the, uh, you know, when they were, they were digging there to lay the railway track, 1886, they discovered about two feet under the ground, a pot with about 250 coins there. And these are the coins that you're seeing there. While Bangalore is very famous for uh, international traffic today, you know, the who's who of the world comes here. The Fortune 500 companies of the world are working here. International trade has not, is not new. So we have instances, we have evidences to show that trade with foreign countries, foreign people, distant places has been happening from here. These coins, uh, unfortunately, were lost or stolen. <laughs> uh, we don't have this except for journal records again. Um, it was um, soon after it was discovered and analyzed and documented seems to have vanished. That's, that's a little about coins. But subsequently, and I'm moving progressively from you know, 250 million years forward towards today. Tarabnaldi, uh, which is on um, you know, the Hesargata Road. Very interestingly, this place has, um, has a new name, Tarabnaldi. It's, it's an, it, while it sounds like a local Kannada name today, it is not. It's actually um, derived from, I believe it's derived from the word Tarabain Halli. So when Hesargata was built, uh, and uh, Hesargata Lake was built, I'm sorry. And the, as a water supply source for the city of uh, Bangalore. So from Hesargata to this location, it could have gravity flow, because it could flow down. And from there to Bangalore, it had to be pumped up. And we saw already the height of Bangalore you know, demonstrated in that uh, map. So that set up steam turbines there. And uh, slowly that corrupted into Tarabana Halli. <laughs> okay. And in Tarabana Ali, around the same time when that lake was being built or, uh, and uh, the turbines being set up and all that, a Britisher who was camping there discovered these pottery shreds. Okay. So these are various kinds of things, cooking items, cooking pots, um, you know, decorative pottery items, beads, which were used in uh, necklaces and all of that. These are on display at the museum today. Uh, dated to be approximately between zero and 1080. Okay, so um, next time you hear about, you know, Hori civilizations, 
distant civilizations, rich civilizations. Please reflect on what you've seen so far. I think this is um, extraordinarily rich as well and fairly civilized too. I don't know what this device was used for this part, but it has multiple you know, outlets. So it's probably being used for some kind of a thick cooking item. Okay. Um, well, you may still think, you know, where is this Tarbunalia now been there? A lot of people have not. It's not true for, the story I told you is true very much for the heart of what is considered as Bangalore today. East of Alsur Lake and Agaram, the old race course, as it was called, which is Agaram today, Agaram grounds. Similar items have been found from a similar period. Okay. So, so now think about the places I've described so far. Jalali, Alsur, Agaram, um, Belandur, Ragi Gudda. What are these places? All, all in the proper Bangalore. Every, everyone staying there today has no, uh, no issues in claiming that they live in Bangalore. These items thankfully seem to have survived, uh, but they're not in Bangalore though. Uh, they're documented to be in the Madras Museum. There were, uh, some of it was discovered and uh, documented. Uh, some other discoveries were also documented by Bruce Foot. Bruce Wood's considered as one of the you know, fathers of um, archaeology uh, in India, a Britisher. And in his uh, honor, there's a Bruce Wood collection that's, uh, est and that's there in the you know, Madras Museum. And these beads here, a few of them, not all of them, are supposed to be from Alsur and uh, you know, the Agaram discoveries. Okay. Uh, so far, you know, I would say um, till about 100 AD, You've not discovered anything to say there was anybody here who is literate. There's no evidence of literacy in the city to this point. For that, we'll have to go a little further out. <laughs> in 10 years, this will be a part of Bangalore. So I'm kind of taking the liberty of calling this as within Bangalore as well. So this is Rajgata. Uh, Rajgata is actually about eight kilometers beyond Hesargata on the Dodbalapur Devanali Road. Um, this is fresh new archaeological discoveries. Excavations were carried out there uh, about between 10 and uh, between 15 and 20 years ago, 2001 and 2004. Some extraordinary things are being discovered there. So this is, as it's, I'm, you know, if you're rushing there to see what's over there, you won't find anything because it's all been covered up. So this is a burial site, like I had already spoken about. This is the remnants of a Buddhist vihara. A Chaitya Vihara were also there. Big ones were discovered over there. They're dated to be from between 300 to 480. Okay. So it's um, so very astonishing that there were Buddhists here at that point then. And this is not just an ordinary thing. You can see this is a fairly big uh, you know, Vihara. So Bina Stuta, Stupa, Vihara, Chaitya, and all of those residential places, praying places, and other things. These are just still buildings. What, what to me personally is extraordinary is what was discovered here. So these are what are called as votive stupas, which is like you know, when um, a monk or somebody is praying, these um, small clay pots, these are very small ones, about this size, they are... Um, after their prayer meeting or whatever, they're discarded and thrown away. Inside these is a small clay tablet with a prayer written on them. So this is a Brahmi script and a Pali language. First evidence of literate people living in this region. It's very small and you can see from the size of this um, you know, how small it is. So inside these are Encapsulated is this thing, a uh, small clay tablet with the Buddhist prayer you know, on that. This is standard practice, and I believe it's very commonly done even today, uh, wherever Buddhism prevails in places like Nepal and all of that. So within walking distance from that um, Vihara in a field, they found hundreds of these. Okay. So very interesting. 
the first language, written language and written script that we have a Brahmi and Pali here. It's probably a link back to Buddhism. Yeah, so the story of the city, you can you know, think about it in different ways. And uh, what I want to do from this point on, which is, you know, we are now at the 400, 580 point, is look at uh, one location and then try and understand what has occurred over there in the last thousand years. We can do this exact same exercise for every nook and corner of the city. It won't be feasible to do it in 60 minutes, more as a demonstration or an illustration of the story of every corner, every place here in Bangalore. I've taken a couple of examples and I'll show it to you. So this one is from a place called Begur. Um, Begur is not so well known for a lot of people, uh, but uh, it's, Silk Board is very well known to Bangaloreans and else other people in the world. Uh, a few, uh, three kilometers from Silk Board in the direction of um, Hasur Road, in uh, Hasur, is Begur. So it's also another route to electronic city if you want to get there. So Begur is one wonderful example. And uh, it's however not unique. I'm just using it as an example. So please don't conclude unique and uh, Begur is special. We can do the same exercise for every nook and corner of the city. So in this one collage here, I put together a lot of photographs and we'll walk you through quickly from 500 to 1500 what happened in Begur. The top corner here, this is a, cop this is a imprint of a copper plate inscription from 517 AD. It's called as the Malohalli copper plates. Malohalli is, um, you know, is in the northern, uh, is a village in North Bangalore. These plates were found there. And what you're seeing is a print there. This is a language, this is a 517 AD. Uh, Kannada as in its written form was still not popular yet. And what we saw in the previous thing, you know, Brahmi script was losing, um, you know, losing its impo importance. So just one quick, uh, this one about script and language. What I'm speaking to you today is English language. I can write to you, write the same thing in Kannada characters, that script, or Tamil script, characters, that script. So spoken is oral, spoken is language, written is script. So what you're seeing here is um, on very early form, so there's no name that's given, the dynasty that was ruling at that time were, the, were just beginning there at the time of Gangas. So this is called as the Adi Ganga script, a very primitive early version of Kannada or a very late uh, you know, form of Brahmi. What is highlighted here in, in um, red, most people with, with a little bit of Kannada knowledge can actually read this. This is Bempuri. This is Ba, anybody can identify that. The eighth kara, the, it would be, now we give on top, was given beneath at that time. And there's a quick, there's a dot there, the Swara Anuswara, which is Bem. So it's Bempuri. Over time, Bempuri has morphed, Bempur has morphed to Begur. So the early name for Begur was Bempur. The first written mention of a locality of Bangalore is from 5178. And that locality is Bempur or Begur. That's how we know from when it's existed. We have multiple evidences of this from then on. So we know that it's the same place because at that location, we have multiple instances of a written mention of Begur, Bempur or Berur or some other you know, thing like that. So that's um, where we start our story of Begur. We know it existed in 5178. This structure here, it's an extraordinary temple. It's a living temple from 980, 1100 year old temple. So there's, um, it's a living temple. By that I mean that people worship there even today. It's not a ruined temple, but date is missing or anything like that. So it's a very healthy, very alive, kicking, active temple. Extraordinary structure because it's 1100 years old in stone. And I would say fairly well 
uh, weathered. Good, good, good uh, structure. Not ruined. Not you know. Most of it is broken. You can't fragment it. You can't identify things. Nothing of that sort. Sitting in uh, Bangalore. Quite um, thousands and lakhs of people do go past this. You know, very close to this every day. But not little. But very little known. In my mind, if I think about it, in its original shape and form, it's probably an, it's probably one of the oldest such structures in the country, at least in South India. There are bigger, more grandiose structures elsewhere, maybe. That aside, in a city, a global capital, in the heart of it, we have a structure like this, not effaced, and I was doing very well, not gone through much modification as well. Huge amounts of modification as well. The one thing though is, um, you know, we'll see a little bit of it. The basement part of it is kind of covered up today. That's one thing. The, um, what, you, what I'm showing you here is an inscription from Begur. We'll see a little bit more. It's from 980. Extraordinarily important for Bangaloreans because it has the first written mention of Bangalore in it. That's in Begur. This is a fort. There's a fort, small fort in Begur. And in the fort is um, an inscription, which is a record of a lady giving up her life in the Jain way. And that's called as Sanyasim here, which also called Salekana and all that. And that's around 950 AD. 1100 years ago, or 1050 years ago. What she has done is, and imagine the scene, scene playing out as it is, not so visible here, but in other photograph you'll see, she will see the lady carving there as well, and the white marks are actually the writing. It's telling us that this is what she did, that she gave up her life by the Salekana, the Sanyasin way. So this boy who's sitting here, you can imagine that same lady sitting at that spot 1100 years ago, Giving up life by fasting is not uh, something you do overnight. So it takes weeks and months. So during this time, she's gradually reducing her food intake. During this time, she also has a guide, a guru, advising her on you know, how, what's going to happen and keeping her busy and occupied in religious discussions and whatever. So for, uh, and, and during that time, there are a lot of other people who are all, this word spreads that you know, she's doing this uh, the uh, the ultimate um, accomplishment, you know, the, having mastered so many other things, the last thing to master is death. And that's what she's doing. And hundreds of people are gathering there. She's now, um, she's now a hero. <laughs> she's a famous figure there. And for months on end or maybe weeks on end, people are gathering her, paying their respects. And slow, slowly the life is ebbing away. That's what happened here in this place. Okay, and over here, a little after that, you know, about 50 years, 100 years after that, this is by the Begur Lake Bend. And sometime around last year, this time a little earlier, uh, they, were, um, they were building a walking track for the lake. And when they were excavating there, they discovered this, um, you know, idol there. You can see it's still, uh, and it's um, as it was discovered, where it was lying is what you see. It's a Durga idol from 10th century. Durga was, um, idols were all uh, were, uh, consecrated by the lakeside. She was worshipped, uh, you know, traditionally in the, in, at least in the Ganga or the Mysore regions, you will find by a lake, a Ganga uh, period lake, Durga idols are installed and worshipped because she is considered as also the goddess for fertility, water, and all of that. So these are agricultural communities. Water meant everything. So they would install, uh, they would build a Durga temple there and worship her. Um, so this is a 10th century Durga idol, casually <laughs> lying there, abandoned, unrecognized. Now it's been secured, it's been taken out from there and it's, and, um, uh, it's going to be reinstalled at the adjoining temple soon, giving it the dignity that it deserves as well. This idol here, headless one, now, traditionally our belief whenever we see, or our thought whenever we see a destroyed, mutilated um, idol, 
his um, mind usually runs oh you know the muslim invasion or whatever incidentally the muslims hardly played a role the moguls who were hardly played a role in the history of this city very late early days they just didn't figure anywhere this is a jain idol it's a jain headless unknown tirthankara this is from the 10th century jainism was very prevalent then and bigor in addition to being a shaivite center as can be seen here this is a shiva temple was also a jain uh, a place this is a 10th century jain jain tirthankara beside him is what is even more interesting that's a 8th century idol of a jina suprasava in a in, in in a certain body posture is standing you will see that similar posture in the gomateshwara and shavan balgola as well as from the as from 800 to 980 ad as you can see this is a, a a site inside a dingy long housing complex we call this as a watara in kannada haphazard you know houses built all over the place there's no layout there's no plan somewhere in between you know if you need to go to one house inside you go through so many other houses that kind of a place deep inside that these two idols are there this just left that place around it's not as clean as you can see in this photo all the time it's probably wild and overgrown with shrubs right now with the rains you can see clothes hanging over there so what happened how did this uh, you know head uh, go missing the jains the vaishnavites and the shaivites not always a very harmonious relationship were conflicts there was always an attempt to dominate there was always an attempt to um suppress okay and one possibility we don't have evidence to this but we're connecting a lot of dots you can put it together there's a there's a mata there right there you know there's a lingayat mata there and we know that during the 14 15 centuries these were very very common you know the conflicts some of them were uh, also very terrible in terms of killing hundreds of people destroying of temples jain bastis all of that so since there's a mata there all we can guess is that you know at that point this was this uh, this idol was destroyed at that point in time it's a guess it's an educated guess but however uh, eight and the 10th century idol <laughs> are sitting deep inside um avatara a dingy complex in begur today these two are very interesting they call the atma balidanas so like um, you know like our mothers and everybody else of today you know for anything which was considered a significant hurdle obstacle difficult difficulty it was very it was it was uh, you typically pray to the god today we do it in a moderate form and we say you know we'll uh, we'll offer you 108 coconuts or you know something something like that uh, but let's say for a bigger um, problem issue like say the plague or floods uh, or uh, drought or things like that um, typical sometimes people would um, take a vow a harake saying you know if if uh, the drought ends this year i will offer myself um, to you and the way that was done was you know you can see the man here holding a knife he is saying you know it's symbolically indicating he cut off his own head an atma balidana so that even to typically happen in the vicinity of um, a temple so the, the two different ones here from two different places this is at the nagareshwara temple the shiva temple this temple this is in a close by temple called the saptamatrika temple so in this one page or one collage of photographs you can see it's a bursting thriving act, active happening place begur so if you start you know and and this is just a overview there are easily about 15 inscriptions there 
there's lots of other art, artifacts there. In fact, I skipped. Uh, there was even some uh, prehistoric pottery items that have been found here close by in Begur. Begur alone has such a fascinating 1500 past. Hardly known, but it's notwithstanding a fantastic past. Okay. And just to make the point that, you know, Begur is, is a unique situation. I won't go into great depth on this, but this is Dodgubi. Other distant end, you know, if that is the southern end, this is the northern end of the city, Dodgubi. Similarly, a 13th century inscription, which is also about a Jain uh, uh, way person giving up his life. It's from 1344 or something like that, which mentions the place name as Gubi in this. This is the first record of Gubi place name. These are other sculptures and I mentioned uh, Durga being an idol, being a deity, being worshipped by the lake. Dot Gubi Lake is a very you know, interesting big lake. So this was by the lake. Uh, she also, the god is also called by different names. Durga, Mahishasura Mardini. And you can see she is called Mahishasura Mardini because of this. There's a Mahisha or a buffalo here. She's standing on that. Four arms and you know, the typical uh, uh, things that she's supposed to be holding in her arms. So this is 10th century again, <laughs> an idol. These are a few other uh, things. This is an Atma Balidana, like I said, um, in the uh, case of Begur. In, the, in, this, in this case, uh, this man sitting on a sharp object, a sword or whatever, piercing through him. That's another form of giving, you know, giving up his life at the temple. There's a Someshwara temple there, a famous one, and these are from that region. If death and prayer is all there is to, to this, there's more of these. So these are, you can see sexual uh, intercourse positions being shown here. Part of the uh, temple walls there, which are common. Formation of life, celebration of life. Okay. This one is a little ambiguous. Uh, some people think this is the Hoysala symbol, the Lanchana, which is, you know, the um, prince... Um, Killing the tiger, the hoi sala, the isana, tiger, and kill the tiger kind of a thing. Some people think this is a huli bete virgal. In either instance, it's the same meaning. It's a man fighting with a tiger. And in a virgalu, huli bete virgalu, only difference is the hunter has died. And this is a martyr stone uh, in that case. But both are essentially depicting a battle with a tiger. In that gobi. Okay, so we are seeing um, worship, agriculture here. We are seeing a battle with a tiger here. We are seeing celebration of life here in these two. We are seeing, um, you know, the um, difficulty of a town or a village, whatever it was. It was a, it was a, a royal person, a king, maybe falling ill. Maybe it was a drought, prolonged drought. It may be disease, whatever. So this is a celebration of the end of such a thing. It's like COVID tomorrow morning, you know, is cured. How would India celebrate in different ways? That's what it is. So that's the story of Dot Gubi. So we can go on and on like this for every nook and corner of the city. And that collectively, I would believe, is the story of the city. Yeah. So um, how, a little bit about inscriptions. How did we gather about or gather all this, uh, you know, information? I show, I show a close up of one. This is from another corner, just to illustrate again that it's all over. A place called Sweeney Wagilu which is probably little known. Most people will know Embassy Golf Links. Okay, or, uh, you know, the uh, Domlur Kormangla Inner Ring Road. This is by that. This is deep inside. So this is another Virgalu. Over here you would find some, here are some, is some writing, not evident. But if there's a way to, you know, to bring it out, you apply floor or you take a print and that's what this is of, it will look. So what is recorded on those is uh, something of significant that transpired in that location at that time. In this particular inscription, this man is um, friended, um, defended cattle thieves against an attack by cattle thieves. Cattle was a big deal. People owned hundreds, villages owned hundreds of thousands of cattle. And it was common uh, to come and steal those cattle and take it away. So defending, fighting against, those were deadly um, fights. People died defending these uh, you know, attacks. So this man has died and that's been noted down here. So this is in English, 
uh, and this is a transliteration, and this is in Kannada today. Okay, so uh, you can easily read this. It's not so hard. Uh, people can practice and learn this. And here it says, Siya Nel Vagila. I just want to catch on that. Siya Nel Vagila is how the name Srini Vagila has come about. So Siya Nel Vagila meaning Siya is Sihi, sweet. Nel is paddy. Vagilu is gate or village. So the place where they were growing sweet paddy is, is where this happened. The place name itself was that. Um, it's very common uh, for places to be named uh, you know, in such a fashion. I'll give a few examples. Say Jada Halli, the Jali Mara, where it grows, that is Jali Halli. Tavre Kere, where, you know, the pond where the Tavre, uh, the lotus is, is Tavre Kere. So it's very common to name places in this way, and we still do. You know, in different ways. We call, you know, the school adjoining here is called Little Lily School. You know, well, it's a romanticized different way, but we still continue to do this as well. So this way we understand Srini Nel Vagilu, Sihi Nel Vagilu, Srini Vagilu, which is, you know, the EGL area. It's been there from 750 AD. And, you know, something transpired there at that time and that's documented in an inscription. And this for Bangaloreans is what's most important. How old is the name Bengaluru is what is mentioned here. There's an inscription from 9, uh, 890 AD, 1100 years old. This is lying in the Begur Nageshwara temple that I showed earlier. In this line here in pink, you see Benga, that's the U Vattakshara, Bengalura, 900 AD. Bangalore existed 1100 years ago in 890 AD, okay? So this is not the only instance, and I'm now telling you the story of the city of Bangalore, the place name Bangalore, I'm sorry. Same thing which is kind of translated here. Uh, uh, essentially, this is Purva, this is Haleganada, Kannada that existed around 900 AD. This is the script there, traced in chalk to make it uh, very evident. The characters are not very exact, but whatever you can see on the stone has been traced out. That's all. Quite readable. If you make the effort, you can read it as well. All it's saying is, and I'll do a quick this one. It says, Srimat Nagatarana Mane Vagati, Perunna Sekti, Bengalur Kalagadol, Nagatarana Magan, Buttana Pati Satan. Says, Nagatara's adopted son, Mane Maga is a you know, son of the house. Adopted son and son died in the Bengalur Kalaga battle, Bangalore battle. So we don't know whether it's a battle for Bangalore or it's the, where the ba battle happened was in Bangalore. Bengaluru, you know, I'm using Beng Bangalore because it's in, in English I prefer to use that. And this was discovered in 1915 and documented in uh, Mysore archaeological report discovered and documented by uh, Divan R, by um, Rao Badur R. Narsimha Char who headed the Mysore Archaeological Department. Not, no, not any Tom, Dick or Harry discovered this. It was by the, the greatest man on the field at that time. And he said in 1915, and this is an exact replica from that magazine. I'll read it out for you. It says the present inscription is of considerable interest as it testifies incidentally to the antiquity of Bengaluru. It says Bengaluru is as old as this, which is 890. They dated to 900 at that time. Today we know it's a little bit 10 years before that. And then he said, we may now discover, discard the story of Veerabhadala, having gone to the hut of an old man. Anybody in the city you ask, how do you get the name Bengaluru? They say, Bendakaluru, sir. Veerabhadala went hunting in forest, sir. Old man gave him this, sir. Nice romantic story, absolutely story. It's a fictional story, not the truth, because we know this. Okay. There's not just one, and this is the temple. It, uh, that stone was lying in a corner. In fact, when uh, Narsimachar discovered it, it was on the floor of the temple and people were walking over it. So he noticed writing on that and he had it taken out and he kept, kept aside. Since the time he took it out then, 
it's still it's lying you know in one corner or the other you know leaning against one wall one compound or the other only last year um, it's been put under a beautiful nice uh, structure a gazebo like structure with a display a placard there intact bangalore took it upon them to convince that trust and you know everyone else there and now it's in a place more dignified more visible and hopefully more noticed by people as well that's one evidence we have multiple evidences as well this is from 1248 in another temple called the madiwala uh, someshwara temple here in the tamil ba wa trans ba transforms to wa in tamil depending on your native language you tend to use a different pronunciation right so like uh, while we would say mahesh a tamilian would say magesh so similar you know similar changes happen or bengali would say the same um so bengaluru has become bengaluru and from 1248 is the second evidence we have of bengaluru existing of the existence of bengaluru by that name okay, and i'll skip this that's not the only one we have three other evidences bengaluru so we have something called the gumlapura copper plates which is in kannada language and uh, this is supposed to be in the bangalore university today it's from 1434 ad it also has the name bangalore in it and there's a fourth one which is um, from a from a um, a very famous um, um, noble man of the vijayanagar kingdom name was uh, lakana dandesha he actually incidentally uh, also was one of those people who went to ceylon conquered ceylon came back and all that lesser known uh, more known are the chola expeditions and some of these uh, but this man also did do it vijayanagar empire also expand ex- extended to outside peninsular india as well then 1450 he is he wrote um, uh, this is a religious text uh, called the shiva tatva chintamani in that he mentions a devotee from bangalore as well and similarly you know there's also a very interesting a 1480 book in telugu which is from uh, you know which also mentions bangalore so if you notice in the first 500 years uh, records itself we have bangalore mentioned in three different languages first in kannada then in tamil and then in telugu i wonder how many cities can claim to this kind of a you know background uh, like i did for um, the uh, begur and uh, dodgobi quickly skim through for a few other localities not at that great depth so what's the story of localities and if i take an example of domlur is an inscription stone in the choknath swami temple this one is from 1448 you can see domlur written in this by the time 1440 kannada was almost similar to what it is today we can read this except it was do dombalu rise in the next line similar evidences for other places so we have um, a bal i'll come to this in a while a bigger story what's being shown here is a place uh, is the name perbolal over time perbolal actually was actually piria polal per which is piria is hiria big polal was town big town that's the name of the place uh, we still use big and small right chikbalapur dot balapur uh, kind of thing so hiri maglur chikmaglur so this is piria piria polal became perbolal perwalal perbolal pebbol pebbal hebbal over time this is from 750 ad so hebbal existed in 750 ad and we know that thanks to this inscription okay prove for this is for jakur and we have professor nasiman who was one of the people who works with us looking at an inscription there and a close up shot you can probably read this it says jakku 10th century jakur existed in 10th century okay so on and so forth so from all the inscriptions if you gather this is what you will see mention of place names of bangalore in various inscriptions from different time periods the oldest you will see was begur 517 then we have bal we have pinya some of them are slightly modified dot bidarkal for 750 kudlu every nook and corner of the city 
as documented in inscriptions. That's how old these localities are. Some of them have been buried. Now, for example, HSR um, should be somewhere here. I can't find it right now. Um, so HSR, deep within um, HSR is a village. That's Yalkunte. So I can find it here. It's Yalakunte HSR and from 980. HSR is not a new layout. Yeah, the layout may be new. The place is not new. It's been around from 980, which is 1100 years old as well. So when you're walking the streets of Yalkunte there, you're walking in streets that are built at least 1000 years ago. Okay, the story of localities, this is a visual depiction of that. This is the wards of the city. They color coded by, you know, they color coded each ward, what's the earliest mention of it in a different inscription. Okay. So you can see that the city is fairly old, starts from 500 and I stopped here at around 1600 because that's really what I wanted to communicate. The city is far older than what we think it is. Okay. Now uh, that maps online and you can scan this or you can do a Google search and you'll quickly get this. It's a live map. You can look around and you can, um, you know, you can go see those inscriptions, get exact locations. Google will help you get there and all of that. That's the story of the villages. How would this loc locality is? How about the lakes? And there's one very interesting example I want to take. It's a lake called Kalkere Lake. Kalkere is essentially Kal is stone and Kere is area, Kere is lake. It's a shot taken about 15 days back. There's a lake. There's a lake outlet. Interestingly, this lake has been documented to have been built in 1314. So actually, the lake has, um, um, something has happened to the tank bund. Is the lake has breached and it's been rebuilt. Well, this is a document to that effect. It's a rebuilding uh, document, so lake must have been around before. What's also very interesting is this channel, which goes out, it's got a name. <laughs> that's documented in this inscription stone. And that's called the Narsima channel. We all know about the Bakra Nangal channel, the Vishweshwaraya channel, and all of that, the irrigation, great irrigation channels, right? Or the Buckingham Canal in Madras. In Bangalore, we have one too, and that's called Narsima channel. Was called as the Narsima channel. Uh, thankfully, this is still very nice and clean. Uh, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of water, good clean water, birds, fishes, all of that. So if we do a similar exercise of extracting out the lakes uh, story of the city, and I have here about um, 28 lakes mentioned. Every lake you can think about, Jaikur, Hebbar, Belandur, Agara, Vibhutipura, Domlur. Domlur Lake doesn't exist today, it's been built over. In this list, about two or three don't exist, but most others still exist. Who said we don't have lakes? Lakes have been lost. Who said Hori lakes have been destroyed? Two lakes, three lakes have been lost. Dharmambudi, Sampangi and something else. What about these? Those, those are very new lakes. Probably I would say still in their, not even reached their teens or adolescents. These are Hori adults, giants, 2000 year old lakes. The Kannur dolmen that I showed you, Typically, dolmens uh, are usually by water bodies. <laughs> now, there's a lake beside that. If that is 3,000 years old, that's how old Kannur Lake is. I didn't put that in this list because it's not documented in that direct fashion. But these are written records. So holy that you know, they've been used in courts as evidence as well. Okay. Religion, the hot topic of the day. What about the religions of this place? Name the religion and it's been here quite popular and I'm showing you some examples. This is from N Belur. Very few people know the place, um, NAL Belur. It's on Wind Tunnel Road between um, HAL and uh, Airport Road today. There's a deep inside, there's a, inside the NAL campus is a temple, Shiva temple. That's from 1350. Okay, Shaivite. So Vaishnavite example here, Vaishnavite because you can see the Sudarshana Chakra here. 
Jainism already spoke about in Begur. This is a, another example of Hinduism, if you want to think about it that way. Durga idol from 750 AD. Incidentally, this is the inscription and the idol which helps us tell Hebal Lake has been around from 750 AD. Hebal village name was mentioned in other inscription. The lake is kind of referenced in this in an indirect fashion. The languages, the, another hot topic of the day. Okay. What languages have been used here? Typically, a lot of people tend to think um, Canada is native Bangalorean. Everything else is non-native Bangalorean. I'll challenge that through this. What you're seeing here is Tamil from 1307. And I deliberately picked this as an example because 1307, typically Tamil people associate with the Cholas. Maybe so, but Hoysalas who are considered as the pride of you know, the Kannada um, dynasties, have used Tamil in the region of Bangalore. So this is in a Ovibhutipura, uh, which is near ADA, HL. It's an inscription of the building of the village and the lake, by the way, in 1307, it's in Tamil. The same king, and I took this example for that reason, you can see the Hoysala Lanchana, the symbol here, you know, the Gandabairunda and, and the, fight, the man fighting there. It's the same here. It's the same king, incidentally, in another place called Badrali, uh, which is on Magdi Road in Canada. And this Telugu, all before the 15th century. This is just three samples. There's lots more. How much more is shown beautifully in this animation? Okay. So I'll play this. It's a movie and hopefully it'll play fine. It's an animation of which language was used in which location in the city of Bangalore. So this is the, um, you can see the, is there's a little bit of rural Bangalore and um, urban Bangalore in this. The blue dots are Kannada inscriptions. And soon you'll see red dots, those are Tamil. And there's also a bit of Telugu in this. You'll see a lot of red. You'll see a lot of blue simultaneously appearing. Hopefully the animation is playing fine in your screens over there as well. This extends quite a lot, uh, but essentially, you know, you can cut it off and you can say, this is the area I'm looking at. This is so clear in showing this region has not been monolingual. It's been multilingual. In fact, what's not shown here is in the later date, Tamil, Telugu and uh, Kannada have been spoken here, have been used here for a thousand years. For a thousand years, if something's been used, I think it is native. <laughs> I don't know what else to call it. And subsequently after this, you know, not shown in this, is also Marathi, Urdu, and a few other languages coming in. This is unique to Bangalore. And this is extraordinary because for Bangaloreans, most Bangaloreans are polyglots. We have no issues. We can speak multiple languages in homes, in families. And that's very odd and weird for a lot of people. And this place is so unique and rich because of our ability to talk multiple languages and to easily accept more languages if required. There's no fanaticism here. We love every language. We are not wasting away any language here. We cherish, we celebrate, as well as we allow and we embrace more. And that's rooted in our past. That's the way this place has been for hundreds and thousands of years. And it's not gonna change so easily. And this is one of the points I made about saying the fog of the present clouding the past. Today we are organized differently on you know, linguistic basis and all that. It's not necessarily true for the past. And a lot of that is playing out today, even now, as well. If people are flocking to the city, they flock here not just because of its beautiful weather, weather it's also because of the warm and um, welcoming people. Yeah. And that's the, uh, how history is playing out today, I think was depicted there in that. 
again about um, temples, and I'll quickly close here in another five minutes. Um, what are the historic temples of this place? When I say historic, you know, I'm, I'm just showing you know, old ones. Lots of them. So we spoke about the Begur Nageshwara, which is from 980. I spoke about this, but you can see it here, the Belur Someshwara temple from 1350 AD. This is uh, open only on Mondays for the public because it's inside NAL, which is a defense establishment. But you can go there on Monday mornings. This is the uh, Madiwala Someshwara from 1248 at least. All of these are at least dates because they're not construction dates. Beautiful temple. Uh, not many people go there. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's actually a scholars, historians delight because of the number of inscriptions there. This is the um, Vibhutipura Veera Shaiva Mata, 1307. I'm just showing you the entrance to that. A lot of this has changed over time, but some original elements are still there in many of these. Lingrajpuram, no, nobody's uh, tourist religious uh, maps. Kacharkana Halli is actually Lingrajpuram. There's a Someshwara temple from 1237 AD there. The structure has been rebuilt, but a lot of the original elements are still there in that. Domlur Chaknath Swami temple, end of MG Road, for all the modern people who think MG Road is Bangalore. Temples there from 1280. This is the Singapura Vardra Swami temple, which is near the Vidyaranyapura region, 1500 at least ancient temples of the city. What have you heard of? I hope you heard all of, of these, or at least will. Uh, quickly, I'll uh, run through some of these other things. Uh, well, we typically tend to think, and I'll uh, just generally this one, kingdoms, it is not really kingdoms. Uh, there were subunits that formed the portions of the city as well. So these are all the Nadus. Everybody knows about Yalanka Nadu. So other than Yalanka Nadu, there are lots of other Nadus. So from the Ganga's period, we had Perbolal Nadu for which Hebbard was the headquarters. Karika Nadu for which Bidarkal, which is Pinya, was the uh, capital of sorts, if you want to think about it. Morris Nadu, which was in Vartur, Bempur Nadu, and so on and so forth. Okay, Just to show that there's a richness beyond what we normally know. And administration was all not, again, kings. There were local bodies, like we have Bangalore City Corporation, uh, panchayats and all that. These were the corporations of Bangalore city of yesteryears. So we have the, and I've called out those locations where they've been mentioned to make it more specific and not sound generic. So there was these uh, bodies called the Mahajanas, Panchalas, Ayavales. Uh, these are a guild. Uh, they spanned more than Bangalore, but they were all also rooted in Bangalore in many ways as well. Then again, you know, it's not all hunky gory or dory in every other swan. Taxation was a big way. Various kinds of taxes were being used. Like we have today, hundreds of taxes are simplified or still a mess. All kinds of taxes were used in this city. These were the taxes that have been pay, paid. You know, taxes on looms, taxes on irrigated lands, taxes on something. And these are all, you can look at it and say, okay, I can tell in Odi Halli, which is opposite Damlur, who's a weaver's colony because there's a weaver's tax that's kind of documented there. Elsewhere, there's goldsmith tax. So I know that you know, goldsmith was a profession that was quite common in this area of uh, Bangalore. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's another part of it. And the most favorite way historians talk about a city, you know, dynasties. This has been a home to a lot of dynasties and uh, the Gangas, the Rashtakutas, Cholas, Oisalas, and the Vijayanagars. They left their own influences in various ways. The only uh, thing I want to add here is these dynasties are royal families. I wouldn't confuse them with language. They all used multiple languages. Intermarriage between them was, I would say, common. A Hoysala princess marrying a Chola king was common or the other way around. So it's very wrong <laughs> to attribute them primarily to uh, a language. Their kingdoms span language, linguistic regions. The Hoysalas at one time um, ruled from Kananur, which is near 
um, Srirangam. Similarly, the Cholas are the capital, you know, which is closer here. Uh, so think about it that way and don't identify the past in the, in the way we think about it today. I'll skip all of this and I'll uh, come to this part but in a terribly short of time. Most of these inscriptions, most of these artifacts that I mentioned today, absolutely unrecognized, lying in ditches, um, homes. I showed you a few examples there. So what we do when I say we, as a part of the group that I work with, we do these kind of events where we want to build awareness. We also want to save and secure them. So the Hebbal inscription that I spoke about was lying in a gutter. And these boys there, they dug it out from the gutter. It was discovered, the inscription was discovered then, and this was uh, June 2018, May 2018, I'm sorry. Uh, and that's now being put up on a, in a mantapa of this type. This was the initial plan. This is the Ganga style mantapa in stone. It's completely crowdfunded. So we used, um, you know, the, um, <clears throat> so, since we thought this is heritage of the people, we, we, all of us contributed to it. When I say us, it's not just Bangaloreans, people from every part of the country and every part of the world, actually many parts of the world have contributed to this. And um, goal is to build safeguard and celebrate our heritage in this fashion. Okay. And um, in conclusion, I want to leave it like this. So it's a statement extracted from somewhere else. The story of, a, um, of um, India is to be reconstructed not by generalizations, but by intense research, province by province, century by century. That's when you know what is the story of, the, of any place. And um, you know, I'll skip all of this. That's what I thought I would, I was hoping I would do for you today. Starting from the Southern Hemisphere where Bangalore was sitting 250 million years ago to the 15th century where we've seen so many things from that period. How is this place, where has it traveled and how has it evolved? That was what I was hoping to show here and hope I have accomplished, yeah. Um, I'll stop sharing now. There's um, any questions? If people are still interested, I'm I'm around and I can take questions. Yes, it's a fantastic talk, sir. It was amazing. Okay. So much information information you have given about the Bangalore. <laughs> the thing is, a Bangalore is a metropolitan and urban city, city, and they they walk up the metro and other places. They never care about what is happening. It is a broad like uh, we are like just uh, example myself. I just entered Bangalore for three years. So we before we thought Bangalore is a city like metropolitan city. It's like general like IT people and no heritage. Like what kind of mentality we had? Actually, when we understand the heritage of Bangalore, it was actually different from the top people. So there's a lot of questions like are we sir? So I'll, uh, I think there's three, four, I'll quickly take them. Yeah. Um, so Satya, good friend, asks, uh, Menes are the same as in the Asterix comics? Yes, <laughs> they, are, they, are, they, are, they are the same. Um, we had to discover an obliques and uh, Asterix, but they are the same. Stone standing upright, massive stones. And um, unlike in that case, I don't know what they used it, I don't remember. These, most of them have astrology, astronomical significance in our case. Yeah. Um, Aparna Agniotri has asked, uh, what's the reason to bury it again? I presume she's talking about uh, the Rajgata. Okay. Uh, the reason, yeah, this is standard archeology span uh, practice for two reasons. Uh, one is if there's more to be done there, uh, they would do that, number one. Number two is to vandalism, to kind of prevent vandalism. If the, if, if the typically we are, a, or we're supposed to be a poor country, right? So when we don't have the ability to protect it from vandals uh, through, you know, proper shelters or from weather, not just vandals, which could be weathering as well. 
So the practice is to cover it back again. So the next time around, and the excavations is done in phases. So what we have seen in Rajgata is phase one and two. In two, in this one, there's more to be excavated there. The stock of it are happening again now, this year. Maybe it's put off because of COVID and will happen next year. So they will, they will, uh, they will resume there again. They will unearth it. So it's protection and nothing else. Um, rich country may afford to do something else, but we can't do it right now. Um, Bendakaru story involved Kempe Goda. Yes, uh, stories can be attributed to anybody. <laughs> so uh, uh, multiple versions of the Bendakaru story. Uh, this is one. Veerabalala was the traditional one. Uh, the um, more recent one has been Kempe Goda. I guess uh, Veerabalala lost favor with the um, storytellers. <laughs> they found a new hero. That's what happened. Um, to understand Deccan, okay, some books to understand Deccan history holistically, I'm hopelessly sorry. Uh, I have no clue and I'm extremely Bangalore focused. Um, wonderful talk, okay. I was wondering, Dot Gubbi, Durga an image and another resembled a bit the Pallava style. Yes, uh, Sharda Sinivas, yeah, absolutely. I think the period at that time, uh, uh, this has come across uh, multiple times in other forums as well. I think around that time, that was the style uh, that was common in the region itself. Um, so, which probably is another reason not to think of Pallava, Chola, you know, whatever and all that. They borrowed, uh, art, they borrowed um, artisans from each other, styles, from, they copied styles from each other. What is in Badami is found somewhere else and all of that. So, I'm no expert, but I personally don't like to, uh, you know, categorize them in terms of dynasties. Um, what what is the reason for the hurried excavation? No, it was not hurried. It's completed and it was buried. Tata Institute area, <laughs> okay. Uh, it's be a talk by itself. Essentially, adjoining. Uh, so there's a holy bete virgalu from around the 10th century in Tata Institute, deep inside. It's broken. Um, adjoining that were two villages. Uh, Devsandra on the northeast, which is the Ramaya Hospital gate side. Um, and the um, near the CPRI or the swimming pool site, uh, we have a village called Medarninganaldi. That Institute campus is actually the land of three villages, Devsandra, Medarninganaldi, and on this side, you have the Matikere side. All of which, uh, except Matikere, all of them have thousand year old histories. So that, that Institute has that. And um, Medar and Ingan Ali, interesting, and if you are from a, you are an ISC alumni, I presume, because you're asking this. Medara are a tribe who work with bamboos, the baskets and the mats and all that. So even now, uh, obviously they were uh, by bamboo um, tickets. Wherever bamboo was growing, bamboo forests were there, they would be there and there to serve raw material for the work. Even now inside Tata Institute campus, especially on the road uh, going down to swimming pool, you'll find bamboo proliferating on either side. I don't know if it's native from a uh, no, long time back or it's recently planted, but at least the tradition of bamboo continues there. Okay. Uh, further reading on Jainism. Um, <laughs> apologies, I'm not a, I don't know much about that um, in terms of either the philosophy or the religion or anything there. Do we have any Ashokan inscriptions? Um, frankly, I don't care. For me, uh, for he was he was one king, sometime somewhere. Why do I want to spin a story of him here? I have fantastic things here, as I hopefully demonstrated. Do we have Brahmi inscriptions? Yes, I showed one from the third uh, century there. Ashokan inscriptions, I have no no idea, and frankly, I don't even think it's important. Yeah. Yeah, some of the things that I showed, thousand BC predate Ashoka. Uh, the um, dolmen that I showed about Kannur uh, from 500, that is the time when Buddhism, Jainism was evolving and a little later Ashoka came about. So if your question is, um, were people here civilized around during the time of Ashoka? Yes, <laughs> and we have evidences for that. I think that's about all I have uh, questions there. Jesus, keep coming, keep coming. <laughs> <laughs> There's a recorded version available um, I don't know, it's uh, 
up to Uday Kumar is recording it, I presume. Yeah, recording it. We will, we'll, uh, put in Mia's uh, YouTube channel. There's only one uh, passing last comment that I want to live with. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, obviously, thank you everyone you know whoever has joined and I didn't see the number. It was obviously in the upper 50s. Um, making the time. Uh, history is fascinating to hear somebody like this and you know, to talk is nice. Uh, but really what we need to do is make sure the story is continuous in a physical form. All those objects that I showed you there on a screen like this look beautiful. But in the native setting, they are either lying in a ditch. Nobody, not even the priest in the temple knows what it is. Forget the neighborhood. Uh, even historians, uh, not many of them have seen these things. It's, it's really heritage which is very unique in the sense a global capital like Bangalore is blessed with it. The question about Ashoka, I don't know where Ashoka's capital is. Anybody knows where it is today or where, you know, what are the dominant places there and all that. That's the past, but the Bangalore is the happening place today and we have such incredible heritage here. We are wasting it away by destroying it casually to build roads, houses, or you know whatever else, we're throwing it as a part of garbage, we're dynamiting it, we're doing everything possible. There's no other city that I can think of that has this kind of a history. Let's listen, learn, most importantly, let's work to conserve. It's our heritage. Let's not point fingers and say it's someone else's job to do it. If that idol is sitting in my house, in my street, in my neighborhood, it's mine. <laughs> it's my job to conserve it. Let's do that. I hope I've inspired you enough to do that. That'd be my you know, best return on today's talk. We are so very happy that you are the talk was very, very nice. Fantastic, sir. Once again, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for attending the talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all.